First of all, welcome everybody uh, back to a, uh, another ERC Zoom call. We're hoping these are going to move into an uh, alternative program where we're going to do more face-to-face -face meetings, which we're, we're thoroughly looking forward to, and I'll, I'll come to that in a second. Um, Natasha, welcome, Natasha uh, de Turan. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing um, about your new book. Um, but first of all, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to save Q&A to the end, trying to keep this really tight, so kind of half an hour um, uh, of uh, hearing uh, about payment systems and then, uh, then Q&A. So please do put the questions into the Q&A panel. Uh, I know some of you had David's uh, number or email them in and David can text me and we can, we can pick those up um, and we'll, we'll address those at the end. Um, from a housekeeping perspective, please do look out for, we've got a great event coming up uh, at the end of November, which is going to be an inflation debate. Are we moving into a, a period of heightened inflation, which is, is going to be super exciting. Uh, then we have the clash in December, so please look out for the dates of that. And then our first face-to-face -face event, um, which will be uh, Isan Mossad, which is his agreed to talk um, on GDP and the discussions around the, uh, that as a, as a topic at large. large. And that will be held at the Geological Society uh, here in Piccadilly. So back to today's uh, highlights, um, unearthing the importance of payment systems. Uh, Natasha de, de Turenne, uh has huge depth of experience in this and having recently written a book, I think it's called, well, The Payoff, which we're obviously looking to hear, kind of hear about. Natasha's background as a freelance editor, writer, journalist, uh, before becoming head of public affairs at London uh, Clearing House. She then kind of later on moved to the head of public affairs as an head of corporate affairs as at Swift. Um, and Natasha currently is a panel member for the payment systems regulator and the financial service is, is come as a panel of the FCA. And so all of that associating, you are the expert in this, uh, kind of in this space. So without further ado, I'd love to hand over to you and, and obviously hearing about some of the um, topics that I'm sure you uh, pull out in your book. Over to you, Natasha. Thank you, William. I think you, you overbill. Um, now, I'm not an economist and nor do I have an economic training of any sort. Um, so I, I do realise that I've been slightly foolhardy in accepting this invitation to speak to, to you. I'm not just speaking to a group of economic experts, but I'm speaking to you about money. So, um, yes. Just well, I, I could carry out with that. Well, we, the, I mean, a, a number of our members are economists. Uh, we also have a huge schools following as well, and so that's really um, and the whole premise behind the ERC was a, a charity that was founded on education and enlightening and challenging policy on on economics. So it's it, it's it, we're here to learn. Put it like that. Even from non-experts. Anyway, at the risk of sort of doubling down on my um, on on the embarrassment here, I'm going to begin by contradicting an economist, um, Sir John Kay. He wrote in his recent paper, "Robust and Resilience Finance," and I quote here: "Very little that happens in the finance sector has genuine need for the constant appearance of excitement and activity. Only its most boring part, the payment system, is an essential utility." Respectfully, essential yes, boring no. Um, a case paper published in early July, one day later than our book, so he obviously didn't have time to read it. If he had, he might have been convinced that payments were both essential and interesting. Um, I hope today not only to unearth the import of the payment system, but also to persuade you unfortunates, uh, much as we persuaded our publisher, a generous publisher, that payments are actually very, very interesting. Um, now, so payments. So uh, you lot are economists and eco economic thinkers in, in, of different sorts. And as economists, I imagine you like measuring things. As such, you're probably quite all, all quite attached to money's function as a unit of account. Now, I think that's a very useful function of money, and it's also perhaps a prerequisite for money's function as a means of exchange. But for most people, most non-economists, money's function as a unit of account isn't an end in itself. Non-economists like me who are quite pedestrian and acquisitive perhaps, but our primary use of money isn't an abstraction. We use it to buy goods and services and maybe to pass it on if we're lucky. And that is the most the, the primary and the most widely shared use of money amongst the population at large. It's for making payments. 
Payments account for 40% of all economic act or for financial activity, more than savings, investment or credit. And all of us use payments, no matter how rich or poor we are. Not all of us manage to save, few of us invest, and even fewer of, our, fewer of us manage to pass it on. But we all, economists included, pay with money all the time. And we can do that because we all trust that our money can be used to pay with, that it's accepted. Now, the acceptance of our money obviously relies on trusting the currency itself. Pounds, euros, Bitcoin, on all of which scores of books have been written and speeches given. But the acceptance of our money also relies on there being a means of transferring it, on payments, on which very few books and speeches have, books have been written and speeches given. Now, as an aside, I personally think that's a bit odd, because the systems that support a currency's transfer seem to me to be every bit as important as the currency itself. We have to trust the payment system as well as the money that it moves. Now, to bring this to life, and at the risk of um, being cited for <laughs> picking on a man when he's down, let's imagine something. Let's imagine that there's a social media giant, and the social media giant wakes up one fine morning in June 2019 and announces to the world that it's going to introduce a global digital currency. In doing so, the social media giant promises to reinvent money, to empower billions of people, enable seamless cost-free international transfers and fuel financial inclusion. Let's also imagine that central bankers' night worst nightmare comes true and this, this new currency takes off and it takes off big time. It's used not only across the social media giant's own platforms, but beyond them. It's used on Amazon, Alibaba, Asos and all the rest. Now let's take another leap of imagination, or not, and presume that the system on which the currency runs is integrated with the social media giant's other systems. And then let's cast our minds back to Monday. The giant makes some changes to its backbone routers and whoops, it's not just the social media's platforms that go down, the currency does too. Now when I say down, I don't mean in value necessarily. After all, if the system is down, the currency would literally be unexchangeable. But down in the sense of payments, the currency would stop being transferable. It would stop working for payments. Not being able to message or post would be the least of your problems at that stage. In such a scenario, you wouldn't be able to pay either. Now, of course, you don't have to be a social media giant to have a system outage. The Bank of England's chaps had one in 2014, the ECB's Target 2 in 2020, and the, Fed, um, the US Federal Reserve's Fedwire in 2019, and again in 2021. These things happen. Now, none of these outages lasted for very long, but if, it, if they had, the consequences would have been huge. Huge. How huge? Well, at the time of the chaps outage, the UK media, perhaps mercifully for those involved, went into overdrive about the impact on the UK housing market. Chaps is used for making uh, house purchases in the UK. The UK press is obsessed with, with housing and the UK population at large as well, so that was perhaps a predictable, predictable focus. But actually the consequences of a system like chaps or Fedwar or Target 2 going down could be far more severe. As the FT itself declared a few years later, perhaps having revisited its first analysis of the situation, it said, a long-standing collapse would have constituted nothing less than a systemic collapse of the sterling monetary market, with potentially catastrophic consequences for the UK economy. Think human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, that sort of thing. Well, as the, as the FT so graphically described, payments aren't just central to currency, but they're, fun they're fundamental to the whole financial system, and in fact, the whole of modern society. Without a smooth functioning payment system, nothing else in finance or commerce would work. So what does the payment system look like? Well, I think rather fascinatingly, it's one great big contradiction. The payments universe is global. You can move money anywhere but its conventions are fiercely local. In the UK, we like our debit cards. In the US, they like checks. In France, they do too. In Germany, Albania and Southern Europe, it's cash. In China, it's smartphones and QR codes. We do it differently. Then the act of paying is an immediate thing, but the receipt of payment is oddly and often disappointingly slow. Paying is a bilateral operation, but the way that we pay is shaped by multilateral conventions. A payment is both a practice and a process, it can be virtual, tangible, digital, analog, archaic or cutting edge, sometimes both at the same time. Checks are archaic, but the very, very latest imaging technologies used to process them. 
they're tangible and then they become digital. And the, market, the payments market, which arguably isn't a market at all, is both concentrated and dispersed. Payments are made to and from some 25,000 banks in over 200 countries, yet almost every cross-border payment passes through one of 15 global banks. Thousands of techno different technologies are used in payments, but a few of the same ones are used in almost every payment. The payment system is inclusive, but it can also be used to exclude, for example, people, countries subject to sanctions, the poor or the hard to reach. Payments can be anonymous or traceable, or in the case of cryptocurrencies, both. The system is both transparent and opaque, clean and dirty. The bad guys use it alongside the good guys. And then, of course, there's the fact that this payment system isn't a single system. It's a multitude of systems. The payment system with a capital S is a public good, but the payment systems of which it is comprised are by and large private interests. Money moves through what can best be des described as an unplanned network, a complex spaghetti junction of systems which enables vast amounts of value to move around backwards and forwards from me to you, bank to bank, country to country. Strangely enough, it works. And yet, for all this talk of movement, and there's lots of talk of movement in, in payments, for the most part, money never moves. Cash aside, payments are just digital entries recorded in a century, centuries old ledger system, an antique practice made modern by digitization. Making all this work is the payments industry, an industry that employs millions of people around the world. These folk code, run, service, sell and defend complex computer systems and networks, which in turn rely on thousands of miles of cabling and acres of bandwidth. And all of this costs somewhere between one and a half and two trillion a year to run, about 2% of global GDP. Make payments cheaper or more expensive and big numbers change. Make payments faster or slower and the economy will move the same way. So they're important. So what are payments doing at the moment? Well, they're getting faster, they're getting more digital and our payment choices are getting more plural. And let's just look, I want to just look at those three things one by one. Firstly, fast. So speed is good on the face of it. The faster my money re reaches the shopkeeper's accounts, the faster she can fill her shelves, the faster her money reaches the supplier, the faster the supplier can manufacture, and so it goes on. But of course, there's a downside when money moves fast, fraud. The faster you can move money, the faster you can steal and hide it, and the more difficult it is to trace. Second, digital. Digital is good, we love digital, on the face of it. Digital allows for scale economies, for huge efficiencies and new economic opportunities, for instance, e-commerce. Does anyone here remember eBay before PayPal? Perhaps I'm the only one that's old enough. Sure. Try to imagine Uber, Amazon or Netflix without embedded payments, impossible. But digital is also quite compelling for fraudsters and cyber criminals. You don't need guns and, bum and bombs, you can steal money from across the world without leaving your desk. And of course, as we saw earlier, digital is susceptible to failure. Thirdly, choice. Choice is good, again, on the face of it. Now, the risk of exposing my age, I'm going to take you on a quick tour of my payment life. So I would have made my first payment in the mid-1970s on receipt of my first um, investment of pocket money. I'd have been given cash, uh, which would have been possessors as it happens, because I was brought up in Spain. There, were no, there was no other means of payment for me than cash uh, because I was a child and a woman and both of those <laughs> made me ineligible for having a bank account at the time. The shops also didn't take anything else but cash. Later I would start sort of in the UK and I got a post office savings account and from there I could deposit and withdraw cash. A decade or so later I got a bank account and a checkbook to go with it. Then a check guarantee card arrived, then an ATM card and later a debit card and somewhere along the way I took out a credit card. So by the time, I don't know, I was 30 or 40, I had a lot of payment choices or so I thought. But over the last five years, my payment choices have really exploded. I no longer need to carry, obviously, possessors, but euros and pounds around, but I can if I want to. I can use my cards pretty much anywhere, even in Spanish bars and taxis. I can use debit cards at the supermarket. I can use TransferWise or WISE for making international transfers. Revolut when I'm spending abroad. And that's just in the physical world. Online, I've got a PayPal account and I can use Apple Pay. I might have my debit and credit cards recorded on apps. I might use my e-banking app. And if I fancy a bit of the never-never, I can always use Klarna. 
all that payment choice is good. But of course, every payment choice I make has implication for others and for the future. If I and others around me stop using cash, my ATM will be filled less often, then it may be shut down, and eventually my local shops may stop accepting cash. My neighbours who depend on cash won't be able to use it. They won't be able to pay. As I think that evidences, the payments business is a network business. Network effects are what make it work. It's no good using a payment instrument that no one accepts and no good accepting a payment instrument that no one chooses to use. But as you uh, economists will know better than I, network effects are complex, they can be problematic, they can advantage incumbents and lead to winner-take-all scenarios. When we think of, think of payments, we tend to think of banks, or at least those of us of a certain age tend to, and quite rightly because they've been the incumbents in payments for a good while now, and the advantage is theirs in a sense to lose. But technology giants also have big networks, they have big pockets and they have big ambitions. They like fintech, angel investors, venture capitalists and private equity firms might see payment, banks hold on payments as ripe for disruption, especially in this, in, in this dig, increasingly digital world we live in. Aiming squarely at the bank's perceived monopoly on payments, scores of these players have been pouring into the sector. And why not? Innovation, technology and regulation have made payments a perfect playing field for technology, technologists. Payments are part custom, part technology, part network, part liquidity and part risk. Banks score better than tech in only two of those areas and not all the time at that. But then you have to ask what happens when you separate the payments function from the deposit function? How do you make the mass stack up? Well, in spite of the headline one and a half to two trillion cost of payments, most of us don't think we're paying when we pay. Consumers, at least in the UK, never see explicit payment costs. Here we get, or can get if you want to, free current accounts, debiting credit cards and checkbooks for free. We don't see payment charges at the till, and our merchants don't price differently depending on which instruments we use. Now, banks, of course, charge merchants for taking payments and pay us nothing on our, account, our current account balances but that there is no explicit charge. So for non-banks to win our payments business, they can't charge us either. But if they're non-banks, they won't have the subsidy of our, depo our lucrative deposits, or at least lending them out. So once the euphoria is over, how will they make money? It's a good question, but there's evidence that they can. And the biggest pay firms in payments are actually Visa and Mastercards, neither of which are banks. <laughs> And they are making money very, very nicely without the benefits of deposits or the luxury of, of banking licenses. So too, the new breed of payment platforms like Agen, Square and Stripe. So it can be done. Now, there's many things that distinguish all of these players from banks, not just the sneakers. But the biggest one is probably that they all have global reach or at least the potential for it. And that's shown in their valuations. And this global reach doesn't just make their lives richer, it makes our, our lives easier. It's thanks to them that we can pay everywhere and that we can buy and sell things online to and from entities in countries all over the world. So there's nothing not to like about that, is there? Well, not necessarily, but there are some what ifs to consider, especially as digital payments and our dependencies on them get deeper. What, for instance, if a particular payment provider decides to disallow certain kinds of payments? Payments to, say, sex workers, certain political parties or media outlets. They've all done that. But what about instead of just prohibiting gun sales, they decide to prohibit sales on alcohol, sugar or meat, or to increase the effective tax they take at the till? Well, no problem, you might think, we'll just switch to different providers. Well, that's fine, but this is a scale business and it's a network business. So it's fine so long as first there is one, and secondly, it has different ethical or political credo. And very often you'll find they follow quite similar ones. And it wouldn't be so fine, of course, if there are no alternatives at all. I think this takes us neatly to another manifestation of the importance of payments, if I can, and then with the power of payments, or more specifically, the power of the payment pipes. So the metaphorical pipes through which money metaphorically moves, you can tell that they're very poetic grief in the payment sector, they love their metaphors. These are hugely powerful. If you control the pipes, you can control the money flows, preventing money from getting one, from one part of the economy to another, or one part of the world to another. 
And the dollar is, as well known, is the metaphorical pipe for international payments. It dominates the foreign exchange payments. It acts as a global travel hub between almost all other currencies. It accounts for half of global payments and a whopping 90% of trade finance. Exclusion from the US dollar system is tantamount to exclusion from the international payment system. Now, as time goes on, the dollar may or may not retain its absorbent privilege, but the same prohibitions that have long been applied to US dollar clearing could just as well be applied to US owned payment pipes, or Chinese ones for that matter. Which makes it odd then that there's so much discussion about who owns and runs our trains, our power plants and our mobile networks, and so little about who owns and runs our payment pipes. Just as important, don't you think? And it's especially odd when we need to consider what actually passes through those pipes, namely payment data, data which shows who paid who for what and when. For sure, there are treasure troves like the Panama and Pandora papers, but consider how much richer and ultimately damning that all that information would be if it was supplemented by the payments data. Payments data is gold dust. And it's not just gold dust to those that want to use it to accept power, but also for those seeking commercial or geopolitical advantage. Well, thinking about if you're running on someone else's payment pipes. It can also be useful to government agencies pursuing tax evasion, tracking terrorists or arms dealers. But that's it. it's only useful to them if they can get hold of it, which can be a problem if it's held abroad. And of course, payment data is dynamite for commercial entities wanting to amass data pools, data pools that they could use to make credit decisions or build AI capabilities. Talking about dynamite, um, it's likely that the, the biggest used data pool, payment data pools can be found in China, where the rapid rise to dominance of the two digital payment giants, Alipay and Tenpay, was evenly matched and, of course, fueled by the rapid adoption of digital payments in China. The Chinese economy went from cash to QR in, less, in little more than a decade. Absolutely outstanding. Now, Alipay, which showed in 2020 the real power of payments when it upgraded itself to become an open platform for digital life, uh, is, of course, having a bit of a rough time of late. It's been made to spin off its consumer lending businesses, and in the latest to hand over its payment data to a joint venture partly owned by the Chinese state. In the West, that's perhaps predictably left, led to outraged editorials about state surveillance, presumably editorials written by those same editors currently outraging about private Western companies' use of personal data. So whose data is payments data? And what rules do we want to have around it? Who do we want to provide our payment services and how? These are big questions that one's asking. And yet, we don't seem to be. Perhaps it's because the more seamless payments become, the, the less we tend to think about them and what they involve. Of course, that's half the plan, to make us ignore the pain of pain. But we ignore payments at our peril because they're important. And more than that, they're just, they're fascinating. And they're changing. And changing the way we pay changes, as I hope I proved, <laughs> changes everything. Thank you, William. Wow. <laughs> So that was that was amazing in terms of an incredibly rich um, and thank you so much in terms of uh, to giving us a, a, an insight. I had no idea myself that it was a one and a half to two trillion dollar industry annu annually and also how rapidly it shifted over the literally over the last five years. I think that's the most um, kind of re revealing piece where what what. Are the main, I mean, we talked a little bit there. You touched on obviously the three areas in terms of great, it's faster, everything's moving more digital, we've got more choice. But I, I felt like there was a continuity within that, which is okay, but well, that leaves the us as individuals more exposed to fraud, fraud, cyber fraud, uh, and being effectively deceived. So, do you know how big that industry is within that payment space is of, of that fraud kind of element? And what can we do to? Protect, kind of protect ourselves? Um, I, I couldn't quantify it. I mean, I know it's big. It's very big and it's a growing problem. And I think the UK is, is quite unlucky. Um, for, one is it's ahead in digital payments. Um, two, it's obviously, you know, we're, we're quite a good bunch to steal from if you're going to go into that business compared to poor economies. Um, but also we've got the benefit of the English language. So if you're a if you're a cyber, if you're a fraudster or a criminal holed up in 
some other part of the world, chances are your second language might be English. Mm. Uh, so you might want to head to somewhere. It's, it's probably easier to, to do bad things here than it is, say, in Denmark or Finland. Um, but you know, when, when we operated in a cash environment, everything was at risk. As soon as it was out of the bank, it was in our hands and, and it was at risk. So I don't think there's anything particularly unusual when it, you know, when banks were full of cash, people went to the banks and sell it, sell it that way. So it's just a, con a continuation of where, where things were. Continuation of that, of, that, of that industry, yeah. I think what's, what's really challenging about it is that you have entire populations using digital or perhaps and are going to be using digital very soon with very different levels of cyber engagement and 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 uh, you know awareness about about fraud and so forth so so that's one complication i think the other is the the speed at which money can move across borders uh is problematic here because if you if you steal in a country the first thing you want to do is get it out you want to move it abroad mm. because it, you can move it somewhere where there's no cooperation with law enforcement in the first one in the first country and, and then at that point, you know, you're home scot-free. Yeah, interesting. There's a cyber fraud that happened recently to, to a, a firm that we worked with. And the money went from, they tracked the money from the UK, Ukraine, um, India, and then they lost track of it. There. I mean, Ukraine and India was were, were both, but it went from one to the other. And, it, and you're absolutely right, it bounced over the course of almost the same day. Um, and then it was gone. Well, um, there's, um, I'll come back to um, some of the other questions that come in by, by text. Um, are tech companies fit to operate payment systems? And that 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 is the, or should it be left to government and banks? And governments ultimately, there's a there's obviously that interchange between governments and banks um, within within the central bank. Um, gosh, well, I mean, ten years ago, you might have been asking a bank's fit to run payments. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's such an important sector, it needs to be regulated. The activities need to be regulated. Um, do, does it have to be banks to be regulated? No. Um, I think there's certain functions that, you know, if you undertake certain functions, you are by default a bank and will need to be regulated as such. But providing payment services per se, you don't need to be a bank. I think what the regulators tend to do is look at things as they become systemically important and bring them more into the, under their umbrellas. I think where that becomes problematic for me with payments is that it doesn't matter how small my payments provider is, if I'm dependent on that pay payments provider, it's systemic to me. Yeah. And that rather, that rather presumes that we're all banking with the big bank, you know, we're all using the big payment service providers, be they banks or otherwise. But actually, sectors of the population might have splintered off and used used other ones, and they could, you know, end up in in unideal scenarios. But I think it's the the you know the continuity of service, the cyber defences, the um, you know consumer protection issues. These are the ones that the the regulators really need to focus on. So the regulators regulating the big tech firms in terms of making sure they have the right protocols in place, so large proportions of the population suddenly don't have any ability to pay or have their or have their funds locked. Yeah. yeah. Makes lots. Uh, in uh, kind of pandemic, has that mass had a, had a, have that had a massive impact on the uh, kind of payments, uh, kind of almost the kind of payment system at, at, at large? Accelerated things, I imagine, it, or is it just on this kind of trajectory that was inevitable? I think it was on an inevitable trajectory, but it has speeded up, um, sped up the move away from cash, uh, certainly in this country, but I think elsewhere as well. Um, but it's also it's also moved us into e-commerce. There are a lot of people that weren't doing, uh, weren't buying things on the internet that were forced to as a result of the pandemic, and as a result, uh, started making e-payments. Yeah. Well, they revert uh, to going down to the supermarkets every every couple of days instead and, and paying in cash. I don't think we'll know until over the long term. But I think it probably has increased a lot of people's comfort levels with dealing with e-banking or e-payments and so forth, and. A lot of merchants who refused to take cash during the pandemic for what they thought were entirely you know, legitimate reasons because of the apparent health scares um, around, uh, around notes and coins may find this, well, that, you know, may decide, well, I'm not going back now because it's, you know, it's cheaper for me not to accept cash anymore and just focus on the on card payments. 
yeah i've noticed that a lot lots of small shops actually saying no no i'm just going to deal with um i don't I, we don't want to deal with cash anymore which is kind of interesting and certainly affecting some of the older parts of kind of the population risks are kind of crypto i mean there's the obvious it'd be really interesting to you get your kind of take in terms of this this is a market that's grown exponentially this year and obviously kind of for for, for a long time do you see any is that more about the currency or about the payment systems that lies underneath it? Um, or, or neither. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say that at the moment, um, cryptocurrency has, has proven itself only as a speculative instrument rather than as a means of a means of payments um, or currency as a means of payments. Yeah. Um, could that change? Yes, uh, maybe, uh, but I don't. I don't see it happening immediately. What looks far more likely is, oh, obviously, CBDC are, are beginning to happen, and yeah. there may be more of them, and frameworks may be put in place for stable coins, so regulators stable coins. And it'll be interesting. What, what, do you mean by, what do you mean by that, regulated stable coins? So stable coins are tied to an asset, so you might have a stable coin pound. Um, okay. So it would, it's really a sort of private form of pound. And... Um, yeah, I'm not convinced once you have this private pound back one to one with the pounds, why I'd want this pound as opposed to, you know, to my Barclays pound. But, yeah. you know, maybe I will. Other than it's in a digital form, I guess, because I mean, this it's interesting. There's, you know, is there a long term role for Bitcoin if we're suddenly moving to effectively pegging digital with the physical? That's kind of. Yes, well, I mean, the physical is pegged pe to the digital and the pound is already digital, but there would be a, a you know, yeah, a sorry, it, 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 it's kind of the Bitcoin kind of type yeah. scenario. But I don't know how much Bitcoin is being used transactionally in, in a clean context. I think it, as far as I'm, I'm aware, it's been, it's used, you know, people invest and speculate in it and do all sorts of things. And if you've got sort of nefarious uh, things to hide, you might use Bitcoin, although I understand that there are other currencies that are that are less traceable than Bitcoin, which might be your poison if you're into arms trafficking yeah. or something. Um, but I, I'm not sure how many how much use it currently has, given costs and frictions and, and variations it has as an actual, you know, exchangeable currency. So therefore, your 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 view would be that it might peter out over time in terms of it's been this huge kind of like. Um, new dawn but it, will it become less relevant as more digital currencies come well, Bit yeah bitcoin is one of many digital yep. currencies and and the night is young um i i'm yet pers i'm personally yet to be convinced um that the population at large in in a, in a country like the uk where we have a we have a more or less stable government i think um and we have a more or less stable currency yeah why would we, which we earn in by and large, if, if you know we need to do anything as pedestrians earning a living, uh, and we owe the revenue, the proceeds from those earnings in, in sterling? We probably also have a mortgage in sterling. Why, why would I want to have a new exposure to something else along? You know, I've, I've, got, I've got my income, I've got my outgoings. Why would I want to have a step, you know, introduce another variable? I'm not sure that I would. Yeah. Now, if I'm not in a stable a stable democracy and I'm not in a country with a stable currency then I think the attractions of a cryptocurrency become much more appealing yeah and the premise behind why bitcoin was invented in the first, first place is um you know governments printing money um you know is, is a is kind of almost like a stealth tax and so therefore that one of the premises was well the government cannot interfere with um, the kind of monetary supply so you know that's a yeah what's um china what can we learn from alipay tenpay what can the uk to kind of take kind of take from that these i mean these giants that have literally have emerged overnight the government stepping in and then also the government's having infinite control um you know obviously wechat is um is a payment platform in its, in its own right um i'd be really interested getting your view of what lessons can we take from that to our, our advantage? Um, well, I think the biggest lesson is that um, you're better off moving from a stand, you're better off moving in payments from, from a standing start. So China was, was a cash economy before. And when, you know, smartphone technology came along and Alipay and, and, and Tenpay sort of kicked off, they were 
they weren't displacing anything, they were displacing cash, which was incredibly inefficient. In the UK, debit cards, so debit cards, I think, arrived in the UK in the late 1980s. But it wasn't until 2017 that they, they outpaced cash. So, we, you know, that's, what is it, 30 odd years that it, it took for that to happen. And that's because, you know, most of us don't wake up in the morning and think, how shall I pay today? You know, it's not, let me go into, in the payments industry, people do, I can tell you, there's a lot of them. And they're very bemused by the fact that the, the, you know, the population at large doesn't immediately pick up the snazziest new payment instrument. Um, but it's not something that we as consumers tend to, to sort of think about doing. And even if we did, if we go down to the, you know, go down to Sainsbury's and they don't take the new payments instrument, that's a bit of a problem. Um, so it's not just for each individual to decide. Um, but that move that China had, which we also saw in Kenya and we also saw in India, where, where you're, you're not displacing something that's functioning very well already, you can move much, much faster. Yeah, okay. So we're not starting from scratch, um, so it's a bit difficult to learn. I think the, I think one of the things that I personally look at in, in the case of Alipay is Alipay's payments are ostensibly free. Um, and Alipay, we, we don't- Are they free really for both them. ends? Are they free both for the, the individual buying the soap from the shop and then the, the, the shop for the shopkeeper as, as well? I think so. I think when you take it out of the system, it, it, it costs. But I think as long as it stays within the system, I'm not entirely sure on merchants, but I know it's cheaper for merchants, certainly than it, it, the credit card alternative was before the debit card alternative was for them beforehand. Okay, um, but, you know, there is a cost to these things. No one, no one's doing this for free. Yeah. So how did Alipay, you know, what, what did it do to make money? Well, it went into consumer loans and it, it also took in deposits. And so I think when we're looking at some of the, the new payments players coming onto the scene today and they're doing great things, they're, they're introducing, you know, they're making our banks behave much better and, and, and introduce much more sexy ways of paying and, and so on and so forth. But they're all going to have to make money at the end of the day or get sold. And payments is a standalone thing by itself. When you don't add on to it with, with other, other activities, it's not, it's not lucrative enough. Yeah. So I, th I think that's one of the uh, one of the things we can learn. I think the other one with Alipay and Tempo is that they're, they're both closed systems. So I can send you, you know, if I want to send you money, it's not from Alipay to Tempo, it's from Alipay to Alipay. So we both need to have both accounts. And I think that fragmentation is not a useful thing in an economy. I think we have a pound precisely so that we can all send each other pounds. Yeah, that, that, that makes total sense. I mean, some of what I'm hearing is actually the choice is great. I mean, we've had essentially, I, mean, I was so surprised when you said there's only really 15 banks that do all of our global um, payments and, as in, and then you're all, all flowing through those, through those banks. And what this whole new digital world is opening up is so many alternatives, which theoretically should drive the price down for the, not only for the consumer, but also um, for the shop owners. And that's the and that is the the benefit, but it's the balance between security, I suppose, is the is is a piece Does that makes sense. It does. I mean, I um, I would be interested to know for all this innovation whether the price has come down for merchants. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think the service levels have probably gone up, and the offering has probably gone up. Um, but I'm not entirely convinced that the cost for merchants will have gone down over time. And in fact, because many, you know, in some cases they have to accept lots of different things. Well, yes. that's expensive, you know, that's an expense. Um, and, you know, the last cash till at Sainsbury's is going to, you know, that's a real expense. They still need to have surveillance, they need to have a till, they need to have someone to come and collect the money, they need to bank it. That, you know, that's a pain and, and that's expensive. Um, and the cost of that can't come down. I mean, it's, you know, they're fixed costs, they are what they are. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced that the cost for merchants have come down yet. So hopefully that's come. Swift uh, in the UK, um, pretty clunky, slow. What's going to? What do you think will happen to it as a as a platform? Oh well, um, I I don't work for Swift <laughs> anymore, so I think I think that's really um, a question for Swift. But slow and clunky is something that's associated with cross border payments. Yeah. Uh, they are slow and clunky. It doesn't necessarily mean that 
the organization itself is slow and clunky. I mean, the reason that cross-border payments have been slow and clunky is, is quite simple. First of all, we didn't used to send an awful lot of money abroad. You know, in my lifetime, there are exchange controls in all the countries that I've lived in, and that's quite a few. Um, and well, there was no, you know, 20 years ago, there wasn't really much international e-commerce. Even 10 years ago, there wasn't that much. Now there's an awful lot more. and We, we, we do need to transfer money very often abroad. We go on holiday far, much, far more often than we did 50 years ago. So all of these things have increased the demand for cross-border payments. And relatively, they looked pretty clunky and slow until probably about five years ago, five, 10 years ago, and they started to speed up. So, but one, one thing is volume. You know, if there wasn't the volume, why on earth would anyone set up a system to do it faster? And when I say set up a system, you know, Barclays, why would Barclays find a, a faster way to send money to Unicredit in Italy when it yeah. was only once a month it was being asked to do so? So, you know, banks don't, don't do things just out of the goodness of their heart. They do it when there's, when there's demand. And there was unmet demand and, and people came into the industry and, and challenged some of the banks in this area and, and the banks have, have moved. And, and I think the cross-border experience is, is probably a lot less clunky and slow. But notwithstanding that, you still have... You know, you still have barriers, you still have money laundering obligations, um, you still have in some countries, you have exchange controls, you have export limitations and so forth. So if you're buying from, you know, countries in, in certain parts of the world, the payment will get held up in effect by government, not by the bank. Yeah, no, 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 interesting. makes sense. Um, future, what does it look like? How's it, how rapidly is this going to change? You've seen it in your lifetime. You know, that, and that's interesting in terms of not declaring your age. You sound, you sound like the same age as me um, in terms of cash and checks. And, uh, and but where do you, which companies are leading the, the, the way? And where is it exciting? Where, what keeps you up at night? So there's you know, quite a few in there, but it's uh, fascinating because you are so close to this, this, this um, industry. Uh, well, it's quite interesting. When we were writing the book, um, the biggest argument we had with our publishers was about the future because neither of us wanted to commit ourselves <laughs> to the future. So our future chapter is, um, you know, <laughs> is, is not hugely predictive. I think um, there'll be a lot more government involvement and regulatory involvement in payments in the future uh, than there has been. And that, you know, banks have always been regulated. There's, there's, that's that clear and they, they had payments, but payments aren't, really just about NatWest and Barclays anymore. They're about clouds. They're, they're about all sorts of technologies that sit behind that allow the payments to happen. So whether it is NatWest and Barclays that provide our payments in the future or not, the technologies that are enabling them are going to, I think, start to fall into, into regulatory scope. Because you need to know that the payment system's working. You need to know tomorrow that it's going to work. So I think, um, I think that will be an area of development. I think... As in, it'll be an area of development because the barriers, what's going to happen, your view is, some of the front runners, the barriers of entry are going to get higher because regulation is going to step in. So therefore, there won't be new joiners into that into that space. Well, I think what, what the regulators, certainly in this country, seem to be doing is you know, allowing things to flourish in sort of kindergarten type, nursery type atmosphere. And as they accumulate more clients and they become more systemic, then they, they sort of fall into scope. So I, I, I think people, I think there is an encouragement of, um, of new entrants and so forth. Um, so I don't know that it would necessarily discourage them, but what it might encourage uh, over time is more consolidation, which is a logical event in, in payments anyway. Um, We've already seen payments giants, you know, they're bigger than banks. Visa and MasterCard, you know, Visa is worth more than JP Morgan. Um, can we, will we see potentially more of this? Yes. I think we'll see payments to Alipay's description of itself. Um, we'll see payments providers go deeper into economic activity. So take a platform like Stripe, which doesn't just process your payments for you. So you can set up, you tonight can set up an internet shop and take payments from me by any number of payment means through thanks to thanks to what they do but they can also look at processing your tax and so on and so forth so i think the the, the potential for the payment for payments providers to move from the basic activity of providing payments into all sorts of other things um, becomes quite interesting 
okay, so it's like an expanding industry and then I thought that it stems into data. So actually it potentially is, because there's very little dif differentiation that's coming from one of our, um, uh, our members, very little differentiation between a Revolut and a, and a Monzo maybe. And so that area, the, the market is kind of almost a downward trajectory and therefore the costs and margins are so tight, but actually the, the, the larger part of it is, okay, well, what other services are they providing? And that's where we can learn from Alipay in terms of, okay, well, it's lending and mortgages and, you know, it's suddenly starting to move into these different kind of components within the economy. Yes, well, I mean, I think we've already seen both Revolut and Monzo do that. So they started yeah. doing one thing and they've moved out sideways from that. What keeps you up at night? This, this complex, I mean, I was trying to write, well, as you were talking, I was writing, you know, I was writing and trying to draw a map of okay, how all this is interconnects. And for me, it's the kind of like, well, what, you know, it's it's so complicated. And so therefore, what keeps me up at night is a bug in the system, the whole thing collapsing. But I don't know, what, I don't, is that possible? What keeps you uh, up at Well, I don't work for a payments company anymore, so it doesn't have to keep me up at night. But, um, but yes, that, that would be cataclysmic. Um, and as we as we have less and less cash in circulation, and it's not just the fact that it's in circulation. But in fact, we've got more cash in circulation, I think, at the moment, because we're all sticking it under our mattresses. But as we use cash less and less, there'll be less infrastructure to fall back on. Okay. So typically in a hurricane situation or a flood or, you know, um, you'll, you'll resort to cash. And there's problems with that because the ATMs stop working along with the electricity and then the cash deals stop working in the supermarkets because yeah. they're electric as well. But I think so when society can't pay for things, in, in big societies, that's a big problem. In small trusted communities, then you can just trust each other. I live in a Welsh village, so I'll probably be fine. <laughs> but if you're in London... <laughs> Sorry, love, we'll pay you. You can, you can come in and pay us tomorrow or give us a couple of... Cucumbers for your uh, no, tomatoes. Um, I think the other thing is the financial inclusion aspect. So what we've seen in you know countries like Kenya that digital payments have actually led to financial inclusion. Yeah. I, you can also see the possibility for the, the digitization of payments to lead to exclusion. People that can't or won't or or you know can't afford to are frightened of, of using digital payments. And in Kenya, the digital payments instrument is a very simple one. It's very accessible. I think in, in, in the UK, probably it's fair to say, and not, not probably not just in the UK, but you know, if you're starting up a fintech company aimed at, um, aimed at providing payments, you're probably going to go for the savvy, fairly, fairly affluent younger person who's, yeah. who knows what they're doing. You know, going for the poor and unbanked, um, and providing them a really accessible um, forms of form of digital payments, and with all that goes with that, is 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 not a very compelling business proposition. It's not going to make you into a unicorn, and yeah. so that, that's a problem. If, unless something something else steps in, you know, I don't think the market is going to provide for that. Is there a um, is there a so quick one? Is cash still going to be in our systems, and you, do you ever see it being phased out totally? Um, it'll be very emotional. Um, I don't think I don't think it would be phased out completely, ever. I think there'll always be something, whether yeah. it's a usable thing, is another matter. But I think there'll always be something. Interesting. But I think I think within ten years, the amount of um, the amount of cash payments that are made will be very very small. It kind of, is that is that a good thing? And it just, you know, I'm, from my experiences in China and um, counterparts in China, we did a recent did a, did a transaction and, um, and they were particularly negative over the state control over the payment systems where literally individuals that the state didn't like had their accounts shut down or that were disagreed with the state. And that was done overnight. And that meant everything frozen. So your salary frozen, your um, mortgage payments frozen, bills, credit cards, everything and as we move into this there is a level of complexity as which we've discussed which could cause failure within the system but also then there's the simplicity over control as in who has who has the overarching kind of view kind of view down is is, is that a, is that a threat to democracy or do, you know do you agree with that in terms of is that possible kind of possible we've seen it in china but is that possible in the kind of in the uk 
Is it a threat to democracy or is democracy? A th- I mean, I think it in of itself isn't necessarily a threat. It depends on which democracies you've, you've got. You've got in charge, I think. Um, it's a spectre that in this country, I don't think we tend to worry about too much. But I think go to Germany, Spain, Italy, and some other countries in that sort of neck of the woods, or those sort of histories, and you'll find a very different point of view about about that. Um, as in people being more concerned about much more concerned yeah. um, about about a situation in which there's no means of transferring value um, outside the eyes of the state. Yeah. Um, I think it is worrying, but I also, I also, as I'm sort of raised in the piece, I also think, you know, vesting private giant providers with a with an ability to do the same before the state is also, you know, something of an issue. So we might have, you know, pornography might be legal of a certain kind, might be legal in the UK, but none of our payment platforms allow us to pay for pornography. Well, I mean. <laughs> We're middle-aged women, so can, you can imagine how enthusiastic I am about buying pornography in the first place. But not sure yeah. where we're going. This one, please <laughs> yeah. carry on. I mean, yeah, I, I, but I agree. So, we, like from pornography, alcohol, or you know, suddenly one of the payment giants says, "No, I'm now a vegan, so now uh, you know, uh, sorry, you can't buy meat or chicken, yeah. and um, but you can only part, buy plant-based products and like it or leave it because I'm now a billionaire." That, yeah. that I, I suppose that almost omnipotent control. I, th- I think that's that's as as worth thinking about as, as the state issues. So therefore, FCA regulation or FCA involvement is is important. You know, they will get more involved, and so therefore, state involvement is hand in hand with that. I don't know how how this will be done. Um, it will be very interesting to see, and perhaps by merit of a CBDC. Rules will be, you know, level setting will be made through that as to what's acceptable or not acceptable. I don't know. It's difficult. It's difficult to override a payment provider's, you know, point of view. I mean, if, you know, if they're pro-life, they're pro-life and they they don't want to process any payments for abortion. How can you force them to do so? Um, I don't know. They're They're interesting questions. Yeah, they are. The ethical piece in terms of, um, and then the, the argument would be we'll move to alternative platform. Well, maybe that alternative platform doesn't serve or they're, or they're so interlocked within that construct, they can't easily move to alternative alternative platform. Indeed. Yeah. It's a, so that the, the keeping you up at night is, is, is that the bug within the system? You didn't quite answer, kind of answer that when you were working within a payments provider the bug or the um hacking i think uh, hacking i think um for all payment providers it's it's going to be hacking so that's the huge that's that's a huge one which is a multi-billion dollar in the kind of industry hacking yeah. and hacking hacking and fraud yeah. because if you can manipulate the payments platform you could potentially make yourself a lot of money very quickly yeah yeah, and I think widespread fraud and simultaneous widespread widespread fraud fraud such that your users start to mistrust the system and you can imagine with social media how that could escalate very very quickly and suddenly no one trusts some form of payment app what you know i'm not going to name one just in case you get into trouble but you 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 can see how that that could you could go from hero to zero very very quickly through through sheer fear and uncertainty and uh, you know as i said the whole system relies on trust it isn't it isn't just technology it's also I'll trust in it. Yeah, and I imagine you've seen cowboys within the industry setting up weaker, as in tech giants. Kind of, and what I mean by cowboys is basically the security is not there, which I imagine costs a huge amount of thought and time and energy and kind of finance to making sure that's that 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 is paramount. And there's probably smaller firms that are out there that don't have that same security levels of some of the bigger players. Um. Well, I don't know that I've seen any of it, but I think just I wouldn't necessarily consider that that's the case, because if you're building something from scratch in 2020, 2021, you can you can make it safe at the outset with 2021 technology and cryptography and so on and so forth. If, on the other hand, you're a 200 year old bank that's gone through 10 mergers and has got loads of different systems, 
then actually your ability to completely safeguard that is is your systems is is a lot more complex. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is if you're a payments provider, you might be starting off doing one thing, just one thing, which is payments. Whereas if you're a, a bank or, or similar, sorry. It's not, it's not me calling you. Natasha, can you hear me? I can, sorry, I got rid of it. Um, you know, if, if the one thing you do is payments, then you can focus your security around that. But if, if you're doing lots of different things, then, then your security defences have to be that much more complex. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about them necessarily going, you know, just because they're new and tech-based yeah. makes them less secure. Actually, the fact that their tech-based might help make them more secure, That's although... Good. No one ever asked a technologist to do security. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Which, uh, which kind of platforms in Asia, well, kind of, I suppose, Europe and, and the US, which ones are you see, are kind of, are you excited about, particularly, as they move into wallets and the, you know, these kind of super apps? Um, well, I think, um, I think the big question is cards the card networks, and they have huge presence. And, you know, for all that you might be using Apple Pay or this or that or the other, probably your card is sitting behind it. So the card networks are there. Um, now, the European Commission and, and the European Union would like to um, have a European version of a card network, and they're hoping to do so through something called the European Payments Initiative. And it's not quite, it's not entirely clear whether this would displace, replace uh, those, those card networks, but it would be a European equivalent of some sort. I think that is going to be a very interesting thing to watch. Um, very interesting. But I think also just a simple question of if you wanted to displace the cards, how could you at this point? Because they're so entrenched into everything. And I'm not saying you need to. You know, they're, they're working quite well. Yeah. Quite a bit, but, you know. Well, from MasterCard to Visa to American Express, which notoriously expensive, American Express. Lots of shop owners don't take American Express because they charge a kind of it, the shop owner kind of huge percentages on each transaction. They have a higher percentage, I think, than MasterCard and Visa, and I, I think in some cases they can take longer to deliver, um, you know, to settle the payment. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that pay, that speed of settlement will be a game changer for for merchants. So you know, when you go to Sainsbury's and buy your bag of apples and you spend you two pounds. It's not that Sainsbury's gets two pounds then, it gets two pounds a couple of days later, three yeah. days later. And I think that speeding up that the movement of, of money will be a real game changer for, 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 for merchants, certainly, and then hopefully for the rest of us. And who are you seeing, who, who are you seeing as the market leaders? Or, or... Well, I mean, obviously, Visa and Moscow are there. Yeah. Um, I think open banking in the UK is, is you know, it, it hasn't taken off to a huge extent yet. But, you know, as, as I said earlier, it takes a while to displace habits. Yeah. But in theory, if you went to Sainsbury's and paid with faster payments for your apples, Sainsbury's would have the money immediately. Yeah. So Sainsbury's should have an incentive for you using faster payments instead of a card. Yeah. Um, and Sainsbury's might even want to charge you less for your apples because you've used a faster payment kind. But at the moment, it can't. It has to pay. It has to charge you the same. So that's we'll see whether. Yeah. So that that's a legacy from EU law um, that doesn't allow differentiation in pricing. Um, we'll see whether that legacy survives. So we, do you remember you used to get into a cab and it was one price in cash and another price with a card? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was um, under, I think it was PSD2, that was disallowed for PSD. So when you go somewhere, they either accept credit cards or they don't. But if they do, they charge you the same, whether it's a credit card or a debit card. Yeah, that was interesting. And actually, this, I wonder who lobbied to get that in place and the reasons why, because that does make completely sense that Sainsbury should give you a discount if you pay with a particular type of payment method versus a Amex, where they not only charge get charged 12%, but also... They, they get the money four days later. Um, the variable cost onto the consumer. So it's assume the consumer sharing the benefit. Yeah. We um we very very sadly. I mean, I, I literally uh, you have got me energised by this <laughs> by this, by this uh, uh, era of the market and um and where can we find your book? 
Uh, well, you can find it everywhere. You can, it's behind me on the bookshelf. Online, yeah. behind the shelf. <laughs> yes. um, at, a, at a local bookshop in cash, uh, on Amazon, with Amazon Pay, if you like. <laughs> well, exactly, what payment methods do you, do you, do you prefer? So, on, on Amazon, for all kind of local or local bookshops. Yeah, Waterstones, Book Depository, okay. Booklish, everything. Well, I, I, I strongly, I'm now going to go and buy it and read it to understand this um, area of the market better because I think it's a, it's, it's only going to get bigger and, and probably more complex um, before it gets simpler. Natasha, thank you so much on behalf of not only the members um, but also the students that are involved with kind of with the ERC to give us this insight into, um, uh, into the world of payments and the complexities around it opportunities as well as threats you know and i think that's it's um that's for all of us take away um and we really appreciate you giving up your time this evening um so thank you very much and um looking forward to having you back in maybe a few years time to see how this, uh, <laughs> how this has evolved or what you're uh, with the next book um, up and running so we really appreciate that and thank you thank you thank you everyone